Hello, I'm Bill Wilson, Wilson Combat, and I'm here this evening with my old time friend, Ken Hackathorn, a uh, fellow gun guy. And we're here to talk uh, guns and the old times and uh, what the future holds for, for the firearms industry and a lot of different subjects. We're gonna start doing a series of uh, visits here, kind of a fireside chat visit. And uh, I've been after my buddy O'Ken here for years to write a book, and I don't think that's ever gonna happen. So this is the second best thing I can think of. So we're gonna do a series of videos through the, through the years here and pick his brain, try to get a little of this stuff, to, uh, you know, that, that uh, for posterity, that sort of thing. And uh, so this is the first installment and uh, we'll start off with uh, some questions on the early days and progress through and, and see what we can't learn from Okina over time here. You're on. Okay, welcome Ken. Good to see you, Bill. Yeah, thank you. All righty. Uh, we first met in 1978 at the IPSC Midwest Championship. Um, you were one of the early founders of International uh, Practical Shooting Confederation, you know, IPSC, uh, and a good friend of Jeff Cooper. Uh, tell us about the early days of IPSC and, and your association with Jeff, early association with Jeff Cooper. Well, and one of the things I would always kind of preface this with is that in, um, about 1974, I wrote Jeff Cooper a letter, Care of Guns and Ammo Magazine. You know, he had a column called Cooper on Handguns. Yes. And I wrote that letter, and basically I said, you know, Jeff, I'm really interested in this combat pistol stuff. I've been reading your stuff in Guns and Ammo since I was in high school. Uh, how do you really find out more about it? Because as you know, Bill, back in that day, about the only thing that existed, you either had bullseye shooting or you had PPC. Yes. And... Uh, there really wasn't much of anything else out there, but I knew Jeff was teaching what was considered on the West Coast, this you know, modern combat pistol shooting thing, one of which was with 1911 pistols, you know, drawn from the holster, multiple targets, movement and stuff, and that all looked really interesting to me. So I wrote him a letter, how do I learn about this? And to my surprise, about well, maybe a week later, I get a letter back from Jeff telling me, well, I'm teaching a class in Fort Collins, Colorado. It's gonna be hosted by the Larimer County Sheriff's Department. Contact Dan Predovich, he's the deputy in charge. If you wanna come, he'll give you the details. So I was kinda of like, wow. I didn't even know Jeff taught classes per se. And mind you, he still lived in Big Bear, California at the time. He hadn't even made the move to Arizona. So I called Dan Predovich, who's become a good friend yeah. of yours, a great guy, and asked him about it. He said, yeah, he said, the Larimer County Sheriff's Department is actually hosting us and they're absorbing part of the cost. So your cost, because I was a deputy sheriff at the time, your cost is actually as a you know, as a law enforcement officer is only sixty five dollars for the week. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Even back then that yeah. was a great deal. Yeah. Well I had to I talked to a couple of my other buddies that were in the department and they were into the shooting stuff and I said, What do you think about us going to this class? And we chatted over and really we took vacation. We had to pay our own expenses. I remember I loaded my, my wife up and my my little daughter at the time was about a year old and she had an aunt that lived in Denver. So the plan was to drive her out. She could visit with her aunt for the week and I would drive up to Fort Collins and take the Cooper class. So that's what happened. We went out, I drove up there um, and I remember the first day we walk into the, and it was in a conference room where we the class started and here was Jeff, bigger in life. Um, and all these different people in the class. And what, for example, it's where I met Dick Thomas. Yeah. Dick Thomas, so I met him. He was there from, was another officer from Columbia, Missouri. And so we had a great week. And candidly, I had been a bullseye shooter at one time. I dabbled with PPC. What I learned that week with Cooper was kind of like, it, it, it was way out of the box. Um, and I was kind of like a born-again Christian. I, this is the greatest thing in the world. So Jeff was quite impressive. And by the way, people have often said to me, well, Cooper wasn't a very good shot. Well, I'm gonna tell you what, in 1974, he was a pretty impressive shot. Now that may not measure up today's standards, but then he, I was not unimpressed with the way he could shoot. Oh, good. Um, it was interesting because on a Wednesday night was the night we scheduled night firing, the night class. And afterwards, because the class was late, we all went to a local steakhouse. I think it might've been one of the chain steakhouses we went. Um, and had a few drinks and a dinner. Actually, we closed the place. And we wandered out into the parking lot after the 
dinner, and none of us were any too well for the weather. But Dick Thomas said, well, Jeff, why don't you come back to Missouri, Columbia, Missouri next year and do an advanced class? And I said, yeah, Jeff, you come to that, do that, I'll have OSHA in Ohio for a class in my, you know, where I live. Well, Jeff was very honest, very candid. He said, I don't know what an advanced class would be. So we kind of left, you know, I did the rest of the week, had a great time. I learned so much. I thought that I didn't, could not fathom that you, you could do things like we were doing. I mean, Jeff really opened a lot of doors. And I'd always been a fan of the 1911, although I grew up as a revolver guy. Yeah. Can't, still am. But so surprisingly, Jeff and I kind of communicated. I came out at the end of the school, probably being the best shooter in the group. So I won a lot of the different, you know, at, at the end of the school, you have contests to see who can perform the best. And I came out on top. And and by the way, Dick and I became fast friends from that point on. We really got along well. And about, it wasn't quite a year later, but maybe almost two years later, all of a sudden Dick says, hey, we're going to do this um, school in Columbia. And Jeff, you know, invite, wants all these people invited. And that was actually the Columbia conference. And Jeff didn't have any intention of teaching an advanced class. He, I don't even knew what it was. He was honest. But he wanted to form IPSI. So he used this class as a format. If he said, hey, let's get together. I want to form a shooting organization. Nobody hardly would have come. But when he had offered an advanced class, he brought people. There were people from Germany and Switzerland and South Africa and all of the United States. So he assembled like, I don't know, 40-some people came to that thing. I mean, that's where I met Ray Chapman. And Thel Reed was there. And uh, Milt Sparks, Bruce Nelson. I mean, a lot of real personalities. So what Jeff would do, we'd get in a conference room at the Holiday Inn in the morning and we would have the part of the conference where he wanted what he wanted Ipsic to be. And by the way, he had made up his mind before he got there what it was gonna be, even down to the name. But he <laughs> let us believe yeah. that we were creating it, part yeah. of it. But anyway, good. and then in the afternoon after lunch, we'd go to the range, because he had to give us, you know, he had to throw some meat and potatoes little, on the little table. Bait and switch there. Yeah, so he would run us through shooting drills and stuff. And it's, every day he had a shooting drill that was a contest to see who could win. Now, the, the under the table story was he wanted Ray Chapman to come from California because Ray at that time was considered the world champion combat pistol shooter from the big match in Switzerland. And so he brought Jeff and he said, he brought Ray and he told Ray, here's the deal. I know it's an imposition for you cost wise, but here's what I'll do. I'm going to run these contests and then whoever wins at the end of the week gets 500 bucks, which will pay for your travel. 500 bucks in 1976 was a pretty good chunk of change. So you, you'll win and it won't cost you anything to come to the, to the, to the deal. Well, it didn't work out quite well. <laughs> I got the 500 bucks. But in the process, okay. I met a lot of real interesting people. And at, I can say at that time, Jeff was still a big bear. And he had discussed briefly about his idea of creating a shooting school. He discussed that. Well, not long after that, he and Janelle sold their house at Big Bear Lake, California. And he got a, obviously a pretty good penny out of it. That gave him the funding to go to, to Arizona and buy the land and start to build what we now know as gun site. At that time, it was actually called the American Pistol Institute. Yeah. You know, gun site was just a name of the facility that they added later. So I became one of the first, one of the, his first assistant instructor. If you look at the old brochure, I'm the first name list. And there's a lot of guys that are kind of legends now, but the bottom line went out, and I always tell people, make no mistake, I was never an instructor for Jeff Cooper. Nobody was. We were assistant instructors, which meant we were glorified range officers, because Jeff taught every class. And all we did is basically walk the line, and you mm -hmm. know, he he told people, well, these are my assistant instructors, but. So I, that's how I met Jeff, and got to know him much better. It's, as you know, exploded. Yeah. Uh, where I lived in Ohio, we hosted the first uh, Ipsy championship, as you know, at, at Fort Harmon Rifle Club. And obviously you would drive up to Dick Thomas's club, which was Mifflink, Midwest Practical Pistol League. Yeah. So, and I tell people along the way, we bumped into each other and we actually, I told somebody, I said, we hit it off. We were both pretty competitive at the time. We both laughed at the same stuff. I always talk, I said, you know, that was before Bill was rich and famous, you know. You were, like the rest of us, you know, you were scrambling to make a few pennies to load ammo to practice with. And uh, 
we were always, we'd show up at a lot of the same events. We got to know each other. We've become great friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Cooper and I got along real good. And I stayed with Jeff as, an, as a gun site staff guy for a number of years, probably up to about 1981 or so. But I kind of fundamentally, a lot of stuff he was teaching, I didn't really quite agree with. We kind of butted heads. And eventually reached a point where I realized, you know, it's probably best if I move on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fame and, and, and popularity of Gunsight increased over the years. Because face it, they were the only place. Yeah, it was the only and show Ipsy down. grew at a rate that was surprised everybody. And I always tell people, Bill, in the first five or six years, it was combat shooting. We were carrying kind of real guns and real holsters. Jeff had this formula for power factor. And you remember the power meter, Peter, oh, yeah. the power meter. It was a pendulum and you had, to, you had to shoot this power meter and move it far enough that there was a, you had a, a, a protractor mounted on it. You had to move it so many degrees. And most people know this, but you, the, the measure was a, a Colt commander with 230 grain hardball. And I think it was seven yards, you shot it. However far it moved the pendulum, your loads had to match that yeah. to make major caliber. And you remember, people went through all kinds of shenanigans. You remember Raw Walters. Oh, yeah. God bless him, he's passed on. But Raw would take all day trying to hit that pendulum right at six o'clock because <laughs> he was trying to download for an advantage. But he knew if he hit it as low as he could, he could move it far enough to make the power factor. But um, I tell people, for the first five years or so, five or six years, it really was, by those standards, combat shooting. The people involved tended to be people from law enforcement to military and a lot of private sector guys, and we all look at it the same way, same approach. Everybody's shooting a five-inch government model. Some cops were shooting revolvers. There were occasional brave souls shooting a nine millimeter, usually a branding high power. But the, but the, the minor power factor just killed you with that. Yeah, it killed your scoring. So the bottom line, as the time went on, by nature, Americans by nature are very competitive. So naturally, people started looking for how can I get equipment advantages. And, and here God comes is, John Shaw with a Clark Ten gun, and yeah. the, 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 the equipment races off. And we even had people who figured out, hey, if I load a 38 super hot enough, I can make the power factor, but I've got an extra round or two. And everybody went all these different directions. And I always tell people, you know, Jeff had started an organization originally. It was the Southwest Combat Pistol League. Well, they had to change the name by state law in the 60s to Southwest Pistol League. And the Californians, in many ways, did everything they could to beat the rules. I mean, they were the guys that would split hairs. And you, know, you remember, like there was a, a ruling that was originally made that used to be if you walked up to the target to score it, uh, Ray Chapman would walk up. If he was there was a question about a sh missing shot, he would take his finger and poke it in the 45 hole and say, this is a double. They actually had to make a rule that you were not allowed to touch your target. Because Ray's attitude was anything you can do to win is okay. Oh, yeah. And you remember some of the nightmares all that created. Um, I can remember going to a match one time, Bill. It was a, Jeff had a, a course of fire. We don't use it anymore because it's incredibly dangerous called the Cooper Assault. Oh, yeah. I've and among it, it what you had, to, you had to run, shoot a couple targets, run, and go over a six foot wall, shoot a couple more targets run and there was a tunnel it basically had stakes in the ground i think there was 18 inches of clearance and then there was like uh laughing strips across which were just set on it so you had to go under the tunnel without knocking the off or you got a time penalty come out of that tunnel draw your pistol we can only and shoot the, the last target and stop plate and i can remember it was dangerous a lot of people got hurt doing it I can remember things in the early days, like the California guys would show up and they would buy these cheap rain suits and literally hose themselves down with WD-40. So when they came to the tunnel, they would dive and try to slide through it. <laughs> I mean, that was the stuff. Yeah, I can remember seeing people, and a lot of people started going cross draw. A lot of people don't realize in the early days of Ipsy, cross draw was a common, because that was easier to make we can draw. Yeah. And I can remember guys, they would draw their gun. They didn't know what to do. They'd draw it out. Mine is a cock and lock 1911. I can even remember guys drawing and taking the safety off because they didn't have an ambi and throwing it up in the air and catching it to shoot. And sometimes they catch it wrong. They would literally throw it up in the air and catch it like this. You know what they do? They throw it up in the air again yeah. until they caught it right and shoot. Uh, by today's standards, we would never accept that. But back then, and the wall was a real six-footer. 
Oh yeah. And I mean, I I remember some big old guys. You do too. That they approach the wall with the approach. I'm either going over it or through it. One or the other. I, I remember one time I was training for the Cooper assault. It was going to be up in Missouri, and you got the wall out there. You know, you know, brought the spec on my range, and practicing whatever, and then. All of a sudden, my, my little boy, about five years old, Ryan, comes up to him and he says, Daddy, I hurt my arm. And I look over and his arm's like that. He, he tried to climb the, the wall and fell off the wall and broke his arm. <laughs> yeah. So the early days were very interesting. And I tell people, I always will have fond members that not only did I make a lot of friends, we did a lot of wild things. And you, there are personalities, if you tell people about today, you know, the black or, and, and uh, the <laughs> stuff that went on, we'd all be in jail probably if we did that stuff today. I always tell people about later on, you know, Ipsy ended up being run by a fellow named Jake Jatras. And let's just say Jake was extremely unique. Yeah. And things that, we had a great time. And, and, but I, and one of the things that happened to me, Bill, was after I quit going to gun site as an instructor, uh, I had people go to me and say, hey, Ken, you used to be a gun sight. You worked out as an instructor. I never instructed a class in my life. I was a range officer. But they'd say, Would, how about coming and doing a class for us? Well, Cooper school was five and a half days. And like many governmental programs, uh, what the government does is they take two days worth of material and crunch it into five days. So I basically took Jeff's five-day course and crunched it into two days so I could do it on a weekend because most people couldn't take off work. So I started traveling a little bit, doing these stuff, and which is kind of ha what opened the door initially into the training business that I eventually got really involved in. All right. Thanks for all the history. Appreciate it. And you can remember um, the growth process that we learned a lot. I mean, people don't realize that m most people started out with thinking a cold gold cup was the perfect gun. And you can I remember going to matches and seeing the sights fly off the guns and stuff. So, and in many ways, let's be honest, I tell people, it was the problem with guns that were not really set up right or getting a gun to work that people started to turn to you, which kind of launched your career in the business you're in now. Yeah. You're a good shooter, but, you know, I always tell people, I remember when you called me one day, I said, hey, Ken, because the early guns were pretty loose. And yet there was a product then called the Dyer Group Gripper, which was a recoil spring guide that was spring loaded in a sense that it had a spring that came to link up, which pushed the barrel up when it went into battery, which basically made the barrel more rigid and the gun shot better. And that was a quick act job on a 1911 pistol. And then you were using them some in some of your guns. And you called me one day and said, Ken, I've got an opportunity to buy old man Dyer out, buy all of his inventory, the rights to a thing. He said, there's enough parts and units to actually pay for the thing. I think it was $5,000. He said, you think eight, it's- 8,000. Eight, whatever it was. You said, do you think I ought to do it? And I went, absolutely. And if I remember correctly, you went to your dad to borrow the money, he wouldn't do it. And you ended up, Darla went and borrowed the bank. Didn't you get a bank loan to buy it? Yeah, from my, my grandfather. Grandfather. Yeah. And you started, and then you started selling the Wilson Combat Group Gripper. And that was really the first accessory that launched your part business. And you sold those in quantity for years. We still sell them. Oh my, I see. Who would believe that? But I mean, it's kind of interesting how little instances that we don't think are very important kind of launched your life direction. And obviously Wilson Combat, um, you started out in the parts business and candidly, you're still in the parts business. Yep. Ken, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. We'll get together soon. We'll do another one. <laughs>